Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Rogers. Would you all stand with us? We're going to worship big today because we worship a big God who is a mighty warrior who fights on our behalf, who goes before us. We sing and praise and trust in Him alone. We sing together. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory.
Well, good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Welcome those of you who are watching online also. If uh, any time during the service you have a prayer request, you can text the number that occasionally appears on the screen. We have people in a prayer room. They're praying for us right now, and they'd love to pray for you very specifically if you do have a prayer request. We want to go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, any of you that would like to join me in the altar, I would invite you to come at this time as we uh, spend some time praying together. And after the service, I'll be out in the lobby. If you're a guest here, I'd love to meet you and visit with you if you have a minute to do that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Lord, we are uh, we rejoice in your faithfulness. Thank you for uh, the Word of God that tells us that great is your faithfulness. Thank you for the, the hymn writers and the songwriters that have uh, helped put that to music, that causes that to make a melody in our heart and remind us of your faithfulness, Lord. And uh, we we depend on that because we know that we are not always faithful and we are thankful that you are. You are, Lord, especially faithful to save us from our sins when we repent and trust in Jesus. And and Lord, it's in his name that we come today and we we ask, Lord, that you would hear our prayer. Lord, we ask that you would uh, do in us and for us what we cannot do Uh, for ourselves. Lord, I pray for comfort upon those who are grieving uh, in loss. Uh, Lord, we pray for those that that need encouragement because they are discouraged today. We pray for those that are physically sick. We pray for their healing today. Lord, we ask that you would guide us unto all truth. Holy Spirit, would you lead us, convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment today and guide us and to the truth. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the truth. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And, and Lord, we come to you uh, uh, in, in, on behalf of others that, uh, Lord, are worshiping. We pray for our, our, our team, our congregation at, at our Olive Street campus. Bless them today. Be with Brock as he preaches. Lord, I pray for uh, life group that's going on now and each hour, that uh, true interaction, life change, prayer, fellowship, connection, care, concern would take place. And Lord, we do pray for our brothers and sisters in the persecuted church that you would be with them as they labor in hard and difficult places. And God, would you raise up people from among us to go to those places? Lord, would you raise up missionaries and preachers? And and God, that we would not only be a gathering church, but we'd be ascending churches to the mission fields of the world. And Father, we do uh, we do recognize on this day, uh, many years ago, uh, 21 years ago, I guess it is, that, uh, that that the 9-11 occurrence event when the planes flew into the Twin Towers and the, and the Pentagon uh, and all, Lord, we, we pray for those who were, have been affected, and literally we've all been affected by that, and, and Lord, we just thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. We thank you that uh, he, is, he is everything, he is sufficient. And we pray that today that as we talk about the heart of the gospel and understanding the heart of the gospel, we pray that you would call prodigals home and, Lord, that you would comfort and give hope to the families of prodigals. And, Lord, help us to see ourselves in the story uh, that we are all prodigals at heart and we are grateful for a father that welcomes us when we come home. And we may I pray that many, many, many will come home today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, if you've got your Bible, go ahead and open it to uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. We are in a sermon series called Lost and Found, where we have been studying the, the, the parable of the prodigal son. The most famous of all the stories that Jesus told is this story of the prodigal son, And today we're going to look at this younger son, and we're going to talk about him and his circumstance, his situation. We're going to consider leaving home and what you lose when you leave home and and, and coming back home, and uh, we we want to focus in on that. And uh, I'm reminded, and we've, we've talked about the fact that we all have our lost and found stories, and I've been sharing a few of ours, uh, and, and this one is years ago, is actually just before we moved here, so it was a little over 20 years ago, uh, I was given the assignment of watching our four boys. Uh, Lisa had gone somewhere to do something, and I was given the assignment of watching the four boys, and 
I think Benjamin was <clears throat> probably about a year old. Aaron was probably around three, and the other boys were like 10 and 12, something like that. And so, anyway, it's not a big deal, you know, to watch your, your four kids. But in that process, uh, all of a sudden, I didn't, I couldn't find Aaron, didn't know where he was, and uh, started looking for him. You know, I was, we, we lived in a, a large, it was a parsonage, but it was a large house and uh, two-story and all that stuff. So, uh, we... I mean, I'm looking all over, you know, trying to keep up with the others while I'm doing it. And it wasn't, not, wasn't real urgent immediately, but became more and more urgent. Uh, and then Lisa got home and still hadn't found him. And then the boys, the older boys, were on their bicycles and they went out in the neighborhood. We went out in the yard and they started driving around the neighborhood on their bicycles. And they ended up, my parents lived about two or three blocks from us. And so they ended up at uh, their house. And the next thing you know, my parents are at our house. And so we're all looking for Aaron, and I mean, we're, I mean, it's, it's gotten urgent, and we're, you know, we're, man, we're scared uh, and all, and so just about ready to call the police and all of that, and then for some reason, I found him, he was underneath the dining room table in the, we had a formal dining room uh, in that house, and so he was underneath the table, and of course, all the chairs were in there, and so he's three, you know, you really can't see him, it's a pretty big table, well, he was under there, and he had a big bag of potato chips, and uh, he was in there eating those potato chips. You know, we've been hollering his name and trying to, you know, hey, you know, and, and all, and, 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 you know, it's one of those deals that's like, man, do you strangle him, or do you, you know, you're just glad he's okay, and, and all of those kinds of things, because he's just three and, and all that. But see, Aaron, uh, he didn't want to be found. Uh, he, he wanted to be lost. He, he had those potato chips, and he knew he probably wasn't supposed to be eating this big old bag of potato chips uh, by himself. And, and the story we're going to look at today is the story of this younger brother that I'm calling the self-indulgent brother. And this is a brother that uh, there was a time he didn't want to be found. He was lost, and he didn't want to be found. Uh, matter of fact, he got himself lost. He went on a journey to get lost. And uh, some of you have been on that journey some of you have been on that journey and you've come home. Some of you may still be on that journey. And some of you watching uh, online, you, you may be on that journey. And, you know, our hope today is that prodigals will come home. Uh, our hope today is that families of prodigals would have hope that their prodigal one day will come home and they'll be faithful in praying and, and getting comfort and encouragement. Uh, listen, we've got, a, we've got a church full of people who have prodigals that need it. I want you to know you're not alone out there. I was just talking to somebody uh, even today about that. You're, you're not alone. There are many of us that we have prodigals that in our families that we are praying and hoping and uh, in the goodness of God uh, and, and that they would come home. And so I want us to read this story one more time. We've been reading it every week, but uh, God's Word is powerful and it's alive and Probably more important than anything that I have to say today is the reading of God's Word. So we're going to read again the story of the prodigal son. We're not going to read all of it. We're just going to read this portion pertaining particularly to the younger son. So if you're physically able, I want to invite you to stand with me and honor the Lord as we read His Word, beginning in verse 11 of Luke 15. The Bible says, And he said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to the citizens of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods and the swine were, that the swine were eating. And no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. 
But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found and they began to celebrate. Father, thank you that your word is true that it always accomplishes its purposes, that it never returns void. And we thank you that you're going to accomplish your purpose in us today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. As we look at this passage of Scripture, we're going to consider when a prodigal leaves, we're going to see what a prodigal loses, and we're going to see when a prodigal comes home. The first thing I want you to notice is when the prodigal leaves. When the prodigal leaves, when there's that time that the prodigal takes off, and there's that mark. And, and I want you to know that when a prodigal leaves, that they've thought about leaving. How many of us do anything without thinking about it? Most of us, and I know I'm a little more obsessive, uh, compulsive in this, this area than others, that, but think and overthink and think and think and think. Most of the things that we do and we carry out, we've thought through. It's not usually typically just spur of the moment. It's, it's something that we've thought about. So he thought about it. And, and let's look at the text in verse 11. And he said, a man had two sons. Verse 12, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. In verse 13, and not many days later, the son, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant land. He had been thinking about it. He had probably rehearsed it. He probably thought about what could happen. Maybe he didn't, but he, he made the request. He decided to leave. But before he could leave, he had to request his father's estate. When, when people leave home or when people leave their faith, and what we're talking about really is someone who, who walked away from the relationship that they had with their father. And this is a story that Jesus is telling to illustrate spiritual truth. And certainly we've talked about the fact that the father, God is represented in the father. Jesus is represented in the father. And then, then the rest of us are represented in either the younger son or the older son. We're either the self-indulgent one or we're the self-righteous one. And we'll be talking about the self-righteous in the, in the days ahead. But today we're talking about this self-indulgent one. He, he wanted what he wanted. He requested what he wanted. And he went after what he wanted. He was selfish in his self-indulgence. And, and really, people are walking away from the faith. People are walking away from their family. They're walking away from the values of their family. In all of that, whether it's uh, geographically leaving, or whether it's morally leaving, or whether it's spiritually leaving, that's all the same thing as far as the context of this particular story goes. And so, there's some reasons why people leave. Why is it that people leave, especially they leave the faith, so to speak? And leaving the faith can be uh, like it could be a decision that you make in your heart and your mind. It can be actions that you take of going to a different place. It could be actions that you take morally by denying the bi biblical morality and embracing a morality that uh, uh, immorality that is against the clear will of God. Well, there are base the basic reasons are there. It's not anything new. Number one is that we all are sinful and we are described by the term total depravity. The fact is that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. And that's the case for everybody. When we say, well, man, I, th I thought they were smarter than that, or I, I thought they knew better than that. The problem is that we're all sinners. Every sin Some people are smarter sinners than others. Some people are more educated sinners than others. Some people are more wealthy sinners, and some are, are poor sinners and all that. But the, the reality is that we're all sinners. All of us are sinners. And that is, that is the root problem that we have. We say, well, if we could just get a little more education, we could educate. They'd just be educated sinners. Uh, man, if we could, you know, if we could solve the poverty problem, we could, you know, take, take from the rich and give to the poor, play Robin Hood, uh, you know, politically or something, then that would help because the real problems are, are poverty. And, and, and certainly I think that's a real problem. I think it does contribute things. But, but, but all you're just going to have rich sinners or poor sinners. And because the problem is that we're sinners. And as long as we try to you know, reshuffle the, the chairs on the Titanic, it really doesn't matter because the ship's going down. 
And all the chairs are going to be underwater eventually. And so, in a way, it should not surprise us when people walk away. It should be amazing to us about the amazing grace of God that, that, that God keeps us. That's the thing that's amazing, that God is the one who keeps us. And so, when we're left to ourselves, we will always walk away. And so, we see that. Also, we have an enemy, an enemy that seeks to steal, kill, and destroy and we're not in a vacuum. We're not on a neutral playing field. We're not like everybody's on, you know, we just all make our own choices and the smart people make the right choices and the not so smart people, they make the other choices and all of that. No, we have an enemy and he deceives us. He has come against us and he wants to steal and, and to kill and destroy. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your life and he's not neutral. And this idea that, oh, we live in some kind of neutral, we let our kids make their own choices and all those kinds of things. Listen, your kids, they're going to make their own choices. You don't have to let them do that. They will do that. But, but you need to understand that they do not live in a vacuum, that there are e evil enemies against them. And they're under the control of the devil. And the Bible speaks also of the world, the culture around us, that this, this world is under the control of the enemy. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, it tells us in verse 1 that we're all dead in our sin and trespasses, so we can't do anything as a, a dead person. We've got to be made alive by Christ. But then it goes on and it describes that we're under the control of the prince of the power of the, earth, uh, the air. The, the God of this world is controlling and, and is causing uh, havoc. And so the culture is not our friend. I remember years ago uh, when I was a college student, so yeah, it was a lot of years ago uh, when I was a college student, but I hear Hearing a, a Christian athlete, someone asked him, says, well, how's the world treating you? You hear people say that. How's the world treating you? Man, what a, he had a great answer. He said, man, the world's treating me terrible. But boy, the Lord is treating me well. The Lord's treating me well. Listen, this world is not your friend. This world wants to take you down. And that's why the world is shouting against the exclusivity of Christ and salvation. It's shouting against what the Bible teaches about biblical morality because it's God's best plan. It's, it's the key to happiness. It's the key to joy. It's, a, it's the key to meaning in life. And, and so Satan doesn't want that, and he controls the world. But also, we are blinded by the enemy. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. So they can't see the light of Christ. And so as we begin to see and we begin to understand that, that really, you know, we live in a, in a world where everybody thinks they're a victim. I'm telling you, everybody is a victim of, of the enemy. Everybody is a victim of, of, of Satan. Everybody is a victim, victim of the God of this world who's blinding their minds. And so as we begin to see people... We see them differently. Instead of them, us being so angry at them because of their sinful behavior, we understand they're sinners. Sinners are going to sin. A pig, man, a pig likes pig slop. A pig likes mud. I mean, why is that? Because there's a pig. Well, oh man, why didn't that pig just clean himself up and make himself smell a little better? Well, he's a pig. And the same is true for sinners. Sinners sin. And we need to understand that. And their only hope is the gospel. Their only hope is that, that God would make them alive, that God would quicken them, that God would raise them up spiritually. And so we need to understand, so why do people leave? It's because they're lost. It's because they want to go their own way. And in this story, this young man, he is self-indulgent. He is blindly selfish. He is blindly selfish. We see he says, give me. Give me my inheritance. It's all about him. He is selfish, and I believe that is the root problem for all of us. We, we, we are all selfish. We, we, we want what's best for us, and we're smart enough to sometimes that, to where we don't look selfish, but we really are selfish. We, we're trying to manipulate the situation so it doesn't look like we're selfish, but we're really wanting, uh, we, we're, we're wanting things to work out for our benefit and our best. And, and, and some of that's a little bit understandable, but we've got to understand this, this young man, he wanted his father's money. I mean, he just comes out and says, give me my inheritance. And, and then he, he wanted out from under his father's authority. As soon as he got the money, he left. He left the house. He left the country. He left town. He left. He, he, he wanted something different. He didn't want what he had. He wanted something different. And, and that's coveting. He was wanting something that, that maybe someone else had or a life that someone else had. 
And he wanted loose living. He wanted immorality. He wanted sexual immorality. That's what he wanted. Listen, sexual immorality is enticing. It is enticing. It is a temptation. And, and we live in a day where so many people abandon their theological, doctrinal beliefs because of immorality. Because they want to do this immoral act or this immoral lifestyle. They want to do that, but it contradicts what the Bible clearly teaches and what they believed, and so they change what they believe. And I mean, that's going on all, I mean, it's not a secret. I mean, you don't have to be real smart, because I mean, I'm figuring that out, and you don't have to be smart to figure that out. I mean, it's, it's just real obvious. And that's what's happening. One of the major reasons that people change, or what I would say would abandon clear uh, biblical doctrine is because of immorality. And we see throughout history that immorality is not a new problem. It's always been. I mean, and immorality is associated with religion throughout history. I mean, it, it's associated with religion throughout history. Even cults today, many of these cults that crop up, you have some kind of leader. And, and typically, nine times out of ten, that cultic leader is having sexual immorality with all the women in the cult. It's what, it's what you typically find out over and over again. And so... A lot of people, they, they, they want what the world is offering, what the world packages, what the, what the world celebrates, what the world markets. I mean, you, you just look at it on the movie screen, you look at it in commercials, you look at it in athletics, and, and there, I mean, it is a, an aggressive agenda. It is an aggressive, it is not a, well, let's let everybody do what they want. No, it is not that at all. I mean, if you think that, you are blind. You, the God of this age has blinded you. I mean, it is an aggressive movement. If you hold to a biblical morality, you are marginalized, <clears throat> ostracized, criticized, all those other eyes uh, is what, what happens. But, so he was blindly selfish. He said, give me. And he wanted what he wanted. And then... We see this in a child. The first words out of a child's mouth typically are what? Mine, mine, mine. <laughs> Maybe not the first words, but they're usually like second, third, or fourth and all that. It's because we are. I mean, we love babies. We love sweet kids and all that. But we know that we're born in sin. And the first opportunities that we get to make our choices in sin, we choose to sin. We choose to do that. That's why Jesus had to come and die on a cross. Jesus had to shed his blood because of that. And this self-indulgent younger brother is so focused on himself, he's incapable of seeing the collateral damage of his self-indulgence upon others, upon his father, upon his brother. Uh, there were financial implications, certainly emotional implications. But also, not only is he blindly selfish, but he's blindly destructive. He's blindly destructive because he's so selfish that his selfishness is... is creating a path of destruction all around him. But he can't see it because he's blind to it, because he's selfish. And he's, he, he's, he's wishing his father was dead because that's really the, the, the main way that you get your inheritance is somebody's got to die. And he's communicated that to his father. His father's money is, was probably in assets and not sitting in a bank somewhere in that culture of that day and time that he had this bank, so he just write his son a, a check. It was probably in land. It was in sheep and goats and cattle and things like that. And so the, the father would have to liquidate a third of his estate in order to give this son. And say, man, he's asking for the moon, man. He's asking, he's inconveniencing, he's harming his father and his brother. And out of those assets, that's what they were living off of. He, and that's what the self-indulgent do. The self-indulgent, it's all about them. It's all about having a good time. It's all about me being happy. You ever heard anybody say, man, don't you think I deserve to be happy? And I used to hear that a lot, and I'd always say, well, I don't know about that. I think God wants you to be holy. I don't know if he wants you to be happy or not. I mean, it, you know, I mean, it's great if you can be happy, but happy is such a fickle kind of thing. And, you know, one minute we're happy and the next minute we're not. We don't even know why sometimes. I mean, it's just like a, a, a mood or something that kind of sweeps over us or something. You know, if the Razorbacks win, I'm in a good mood. If they lose, I'm in a bad mood. I mean, you know, we're so fickle on, on what we are. And I understand that because I'm that, I'm that guy. I mean, y'all know me. I mean, uh, so, but, so God wants us to be holy, but the self-indulgent, they live on happiness, 
They're hedonistic, and their hedonism is not focused on the glory of God, as Piper often espouses, but their hedonism is focused on selfish desire and pleasure and immorality and things like that. And they want to be happy. They think they have a right to be happy, and the price for their happiness is most often paid by someone else, and they don't even care. That is typically, in like a tornado or a flood or a war, A pathway of destruction is left for generations to come to observe the implications and the impact of that. That is the blindly selfish and destructive choices of this prodigal son. Well, why the prodigal leaves that way? Why does he? In verse 13 it says, And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Well, certainly the prodigal lives uh, this life of sin because he's a sinner, as we've already said, and He lives his life because of the enemy. Satan has deceived him and he is walking in that deceptive way. And the flesh craves the immorality of sex and uh, drunkenness and carousing and things like that. And the world influences him. And uh, it is a, a, a terrible thing. And we live in a day where we see that so prevalent today. That so many are living a life of self indulgence. And the pressure is on churches to endorse that. And the pressure is also on not to be, you know, the, the, the Debbie Downer. And I'm sorry if your name's Debbie. I, I mean, it's just, you know, it's just kind of a, it's a lot better if your name was John, right? I mean, you know, then, uh, but anyway. So, but, but the reality is that we live in that day that uh, people don't want to go to a church where someone's going to talk about the fact that there is, you know, sexual immorality is, is sinful And those who live in habitual sin, there's sin lists out there that say, these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. They'll not go to heaven. And uh, and certainly we're saved by grace through faith. And certainly someone can commit an act of adultery or uh, sinful activity and and be be saved and be forgiven and all those kind of things. But those who pursue that as a lifestyle and condone that as a lifestyle are are not going to have a part in God's kingdom according to what the word of God says. So, uh, what does the prodigal lose? What is it that he lose? He loses. Well, verse 14 says, Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. Well, ultimately, he lost everything is what he lost. But he lost some things along the way in this decision. First of all, he lost the protection of the father. When he was in the father's house, he was underneath the umbrella of protection of the father. And God has established the home as an institution of provision and protection for us. That is in the context of the home that that and the family that we are to live our lives out. And yes, extended families, that, that God blesses and honors that. And that is the plan of God. It is his, his plan in the garden for us to be a part of a family. And then God has given us the church family, a spiritual family that he gives to us, that, that is a part of us sharing life and community. And also, we have protection in that family that we hold each other accountable. And if, if I start doing some things and heading this direction, that someone will come and say, hey, Wes, you're, you're about to get off in the ditch here, man. Let's get back up on the road. And, and that we're here to help one another to, to stay out of the ditches so we can live life and, and, and experience the blessing in the hand of God and, and glorify Him in our life. And so God has given us that. And when we remove ourselves from the protection of the family and the church family, we're living outside God's will. And so this, this uh, young son, he lost the protection of the father. Uh, he, he, he moved outside the home, moved outside the city, moved outside the country to a different place to where his father's influence was not there. And because of that, his poor decision made him susceptible to the fact that the famine came. There was no margin, and we didn't see no record, and it doesn't really address it, but you would imagine that in the father's home that, that they were probably famine-proof for a season, that there was some margin there. But he removed himself from that, so he was susceptible to that. Also, he lost not only the protection of the father, but he lost, maybe more importantly, the influence of the father. That the father influenced him, that when he was there in the presence of the father, that 
There's a lot of things he could learn from the Father, the principle of hard work, the, the principle of integrity, the principle of, of, of generosity, and, and, and all of those kinds of things. And he lost the influence of his father. And it was a costly choice that he made. He made that choice, but it was very costly. He also lost the good name of his father, that his father was no doubt a, a, a well-respected man, and he shamed his father. He embarrassed his father. He left and even created a scenario where the father even gave him his inheritance, which would uh, cause the father to be under criticism by outsiders looking at, well, what kind of guy would do that? But not only outsiders, but even the older brother would criticize the father because of what he did. He lost the good name of his father in what he did. He had no regard for that. He did not connect with that. That was a no importance to him. He also lost his own personal dignity and the fact that he ended up in the pig pen. Uh, the lowest place that a, a Jew in that day could, could ever be would be uh, the pig pen. He had hit rock bottom. In other words, he had lost everything. And that's what sin does. Sin promises the moon and, and delivers a garbage dump. And that's what it always does. And uh, someone has said... Uh, Years ago, sin takes you farther than you want to go, keeps you longer than you want to stay, and costs you more than you want to pay. And that's what sin always does. Sin is not your friend. So there may be a season of enticement. There may be a, a covetousness that causes you to want to, to go to that self-indulgent, uh, faraway, distant land of riotous living and loose living, but it never pays. It only pays harshly, and it destroys people. And then when the prodigal longs for home. Let me talk to you for a minute about that. In verse 17 it says, When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and, I, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. There is a longing for home, I believe, in the heart of every person, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, I believe, it, it says that God has placed eternity in our hearts, that there's a longing for a better place, and, you know, and ultimately that's heaven, that's what we long for, that's what we look for, but, but I think we can have a little bit of heaven on earth, I think there can be, a, you know, it's not perfect, but our families can be those times when we're kind of all together and nobody's fussing and there's not, and you forget about all the other problems. There's those moments of, of peace and, and joy that you have. And, and I think we can have that in the church family, that there can be a pocket of revival and awakening and a sensing of the presence of God, knowing that the world all around us is in trouble and all that. But we can have those moments and hopefully we have some of those in our times of worship. But there's something in us longing for home, longing for a heavenly home and this young son came to the end of himself and he began to, to long for his father's home. And, and it says that he had come to his senses. He had come to his senses. He came to himself that there was a point that he came to that he realized his attitude changed. That this father that he said, give me, give me your money and I'm just soon you be dead. Now he's thinking, man, I'm going to go to my father's house. He's thinking differently. He's changed his attitude. And that is repentance. That is when we change our mind about our sin and about ourselves. We, we quit trying to self-justify. We quit trying to self-indulge. And we've gotten to the end of our rope, so to speak. We're at the bottom we realize that there's nowhere to look up but, but up, to look up anywhere to look but up. And so he's looking up. He came to his senses in 2 Timothy 2, 20, 25. It says this, with gentleness, correcting, he's talking about the pastor, with, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. And then when God grants them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, then it says this, and they may come to their senses. <laughs> they would come to their senses. This is what this, this man did, this prodigal. He, he came to his senses. He was granted repentance is what was, was taking place. He came to his senses and in doing so, he escapes from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. And so, 
Certainly Paul is contributing as we look back at Scripture, interprets Scripture and, and adds and helps us to understand it better. But he, he had to come to his senses. He had to be granted repentance. And then he had to consider what he would do next. The proof of genuine repentance is that we don't stay the same. We don't stay in the pig pen. We're not just sorry about the pig pen. We just don't know, well, man, I could go to my father's house and, and you know, not live like a pig. But you know what? I think I'm just going to stay here. I mean, no, he, he had to think and he, and he thought through it. He, he considered what was involved in that because he's talking to himself in that and, and, and what, he, what he said that he would do. And then later he does it. And he decided to get up. I will arise and go to my father's house. He had to get up out of the pig pen. You cannot stay in the pig pen and then also live in your father's house. You can't have dual citizenships in this. You can't live in two worlds or two places or two houses. You're going to be in one place or the other. You can't necessarily keep the same ungodly friends that drag you down into drunkenness and drugs and all other kinds of sin. You've got to walk away from sexual immorality. If you want to return to your father's house, you've got to leave the pig pen. You can't stay there. You've got to want to leave. That's what it means to come to your senses. Now, I think it's a good opportunity for us to point out this, that the father did not need to repent <laughs> and go to the pig pen. He didn't need to do that. The father didn't need to go and meet his son halfway towards the pig pen. And we live in a time now where the, in this story, the, if they were telling, the modern culture was telling that story, they'd tell the story, well, the, the father decided that he needed to go to the pig pen where the son was and hang out in the pig pen, build the son a condo in the pig pen. Hang out in the pig pen. That's not, the, that's not the point. The point is that this self-indulgent son had to leave the pig pen and he had to come to his father's house because his father's house was a place where there's safety and there's security and there's provision and there's food and there's love and there, there's morality. There's all of these things. It's, at the, it's not over here. It's not over here. It's not the father said, well, you know what? We need to become more like the world and, and, and be tainted with the world and so we'll just all be together. No, because the, the hope is at the Father's house. And that's why we can't compromise the gospel. And we can't compromise the Word of God. Because when you compromise the gospel and the Word of God, you're taking the power of the gospel out. And you're creating some Jesus. It's not the Jesus who came to rescue people from sin. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what he came for. He didn't come to live in the pig pen with us. Now, he came to the pig pen of, the, of earth to get us out of the pig pen. And that's why Jesus came. And so he, and, and this son, when he comes to his senses, he knows, I don't need to be in this pig pen. That's part of knowing what repentance is. That they, that, and God grants that. God lets us know this is wrong. God lets us know this is not where we're supposed to be. And so he, he understood that, and he decided he confessed his sins, and, and he did not expect full restoration. He, he said, you know, I don't deserve to be your son. I'll come as a hired hand. And that's another indication of genuine repentance, that we don't come in arrogance and cockiness and, and things like that, but we come hu uh, hu in humility. We're, we're willing to be, uh, uh, you know, to be a hired hand, <laughs> We're willing to do the, the most menial thing there is. We're not the big shot. We're not the one uh, wanting the spotlight on us. That's not what we're wanting. And that is reflective of an attitude of repentance before God. Not justifying, self-justifying why we did what we did. But, oh, I've, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against your name, Father. And that's the attitude in which he came. But what he did know, he did know that he could come home. He did know he could come home, welcoming the prodigal once lost home. And in verse 20 says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father said to his slave, quickly bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf, kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and, and has been found. And they began to celebrate. He knew he could come home. He knew he could come home. Listen, 
In our culture today, we need people to know that they can come home, but we also need to understand that the problem that, that is going on today, is it's a sin problem, and Jesus is a solution for the sin problem. He's the only solution. There's, there's no other solution. He was welcomed back by his Father in the same way that God welcomes us back. We should not be surprised when people walk away in sinful rebellion against God because that's what sinners do, what we should be amazed at. We should be amazed that God, in his grace, brings people home and they stay home. (laughs) It is the amazing grace of God. If it was left up to you and me, we would always walk away from God. He was fully restored. The lure of sin, it binds us and blinds us and leads us into a far distant land of sin, sexual immorality, and all kinds of sin. And yet, we also see the lure of sin. It promises a happiness that it cannot deliver. It only delivers death and ashes. The the curse of sin is death. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. And our hope is in this gift of repentance and faith that results in a transformed life, in a new place, a place with the Father. And so it's the picture of us getting to live in the Father's house, whether we're a self-indulgent prodigal or we're a self-righteous prodigal. It really doesn't matter. We, we, We all need the gospel. We all need to be saved by grace. We all need to be saved by the same Christ who hung on a cross for our sin and rose from the dead. And that's the gospel And that's the point that Jesus is making to these Pharisees. And this is the point Jesus is making to us today. Would you bow your head with me in prayer?